verses 12 through 21. As I give this title tonight, Staying on the Course, I want you to imagine a, a trail race. Has anyone here ever, ever heard of the, uh, the Barkley Marathons? The Barkley Marathon? Okay, like three people, okay. Um, the Barkley Marathon, and to kind of give you an idea about this race, we go to the next slide, uh, Macy. The Barkley Marathon is referred to as the race that eats its young. And there was a documentary on this on Netflix. And it's interesting, I just clicked on it one night, I started to watch it, and, and I realized that this race takes place in Wartburg, Tennessee, in Frozen Head National Park. It's an ultra marathon trail race. It started in 1986. It's a very interesting race. If you've ever, ever researched it much or heard anything about it. So you run 100 miles. It's like, um, and I think during this 100 mile run, you have 60 hours to complete it. There's 40 runners that are selected each year for this race. I don't know how well you can see in this picture uh, these feet that are destroyed, these legs that are just completely eaten up. You can see this guy coming up the hill there. It's a really steep incline. You change elevation like 50,000 feet or something during the course of this, these 100 miles. You have 60 hours to complete it. And this is, there's really no trail. You're just like running through the woods. You can kind of see a trail cut up there behind this man, but that's just like a power line. There's no trail. You just take off running through the woods. So it's a very interesting race. You're a chance to, to research it. I think you would enjoy it. But um, out of, I think, over 15 or over a thousand um, participants, only 40 people a year get chosen for it. You get a, a condolence letter uh, when you get accepted to run this race. It's like a dollar and sixty cents application fee. It's ran by this really eccentric guy named Lazarus Lake. And uh, to start the race, he lights a cigarette. That's what, then everybody starts running. So it's really crazy. Um, but anyway, it is interesting. And out of a thousand participants, only 15 runners have ever completed this race, the Barkley Marathon. It takes place over here in Warburg, Tennessee. And as I think about that, that's, you know, think about a trail race. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight, staying on the course. Think about staying on the course of a trail race. And as we think about that, you think about a race like this, I don't care. There's people who come from all over the country, from all over the world to run in this race. People that run in ultra marathon races of, of 100 miles in like three days or something, um, or, or less than that. And really just people that are, are really talented, they're very fast, they have a tremendous stamina. But the point I'm getting at tonight is I don't care how fast you are or how much stamina, stamina you have. If you get off course, it's over. If you get off course, you're done and you lose. There have been participants who got, and you have to run to these different locations where there's like um, some book and you have to rip out a page from that book and put it to prove that you've been to those different locations, those different spots. There have been people who are very experienced trail racers who have ran in this race. They got off track and they found them like a county away from where they were running at. I don't care how fast you are, I don't care how good your stamina is, how much you've trained, you can train for 10 years, but if you get that far off course, it's over, okay? And tonight I use that as kind of an analogy because the same is true for our pursuit of Christ and our pursuit of truth. That's why I entitled the message tonight, Staying on the Course. Two weeks ago we were in chapter 3, and the Apostle Paul had just made the strong case that tradition and religious works are a dead end. That tradition and religious works are a dead end. They will never get you to God. They will never get you to God. Paul, as we know from his, his background, his biography, he was a master in the Jewish religion. And understand that, that Judaism, you think about the law, you think about Moses, this was given by God. And Paul was a master in the Jewish religion. He devoted his entire life from birth into, and basically into being a good Jew who, who kept the law, who was obedient to the law. He, he devoted his entire life from birth to this. And what he discovered, probably sometime in his, in his 30s, maybe, maybe a little bit sooner than that, a little bit later than that, but, but well into his life, what he realized was it wasn't enough. And it almost eternally destroyed him. Now, we have our version of this today. You may sit here and say, well, I'm not trying to pursue salvation or try to find my way to God through the Jewish religion. But we have our version of this today, and it's what I would call um, churchianity. There's a big difference between Christianity and churchianity. 
Basically, what, what I'm describing is the Christian religion and rule-keeping, but without Christ, without knowing the infinite Son of God. What Paul experienced and what you can experience in a Baptist church today or any other Protestant denomination, what Paul experienced you can experience today is that he spent a lifetime around the truth. But the truth never got in. You can spend a lifetime around the truth in a Baptist church, around the Scriptures. This is true. You can read it. You can carry it with you. You can carry it back and forth to church for 80 years and be all around the truth, but the truth never get in. Paul is an expert witness that you cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot fix your guilt before God by doing more and doing better. That's, what, that's our default position is we recognize, I was listening to some sermons yesterday and, and one man made a good point. He said, you know, you can preach really hard against sin. You can preach really hard against evil, against sin, but in his experience, and I think it's in my experience as well, people know there's a problem. They may try to deny it, and probably the more loudly they try to deny it, the more they are aware that there's something broken here. The more they realize that they're broken, the more that they realize that they've done wrong. It, does, it should not take long at all to convince someone that they've made mistakes, that they're a sinner, that they have guilt. You can't fix your guilt by doing more or by doing better. That's our default position. We think, well, I'll just do better next time. I'll do better tomorrow. I failed today. I messed up today. I know I shouldn't have done that. My conscience is convicting me. I should not have done that, but I'll do better tomorrow. You cannot fix it that way. You cannot fix your guilt that way. That's what Paul realized. What it comes down to is we must have Christ. The sacrifice and the only sufficient payment to pay for our sin. We must have His forgiveness and His grace and His righteousness. That's what Paul described earlier in chapter 3 as we went over two weeks ago. That's what Paul was saying. He, he said, good works, going to church, uh, reading your Bible, those are really good things, but they cannot save you. I don't care how much you read it, how much you memorize it. I don't care how many times you go to church throughout your life. I don't care if you never miss a service from the day you're born to the day you die. It is not enough to save you and to make you right with God. You must have Christ. You must have His forgiveness, His grace, His righteousness. His perfect righteousness. You must have Him. That was the title of the message two weeks ago. Him, Him, Him. You must have Christ. The question you need to ask yourself tonight, and, and by the way, everything I've just said would apply to a Sunday night crowd. You look around and think, you know, there were probably three times as many people here this morning or more. You're part of the faithful few. You're here on a Sunday night. That's exactly who Paul's. Paul would have been here on a Sunday night when he was on his way to hell trying to please God through religion. So I ask you tonight, do you have him? Do you have Christ? That's the question. That's what we really dealt with two weeks ago earlier in this chapter. But Paul has confirmed... And that, that now he has Christ. That he was trying to earn his salvation. He was trying to earn his way back to God through religious works, through good works, through, through religious service. But Paul has confirmed, but now I have Christ. So now what? And that brings us to verses 12 through 21. If you would please stand in honor of God's word as we begin tonight by reading Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Staying on the course. We read verses 12 and 13. It says, not as though I'd already attained. So Paul is saying, I was, I was running this race. I was doing everything I could to, to make up for my sin, to make up for the evil that I had done, the mistakes that I had made, and he could not do it. Finally realized that you can only find that in Christ, his forgiveness, his grace, his righteousness, his perfect righteousness, that Christ was sinless on our behalf. So now Paul has Christ. So now what does he do? Verse 12. Not as though I'd already attained either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's saying, I'm going to take hold of that which has taken hold of me, which is the truth, which is the gospel. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. We're going to stop right there and go, Lord, in prayer together. 
Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time together tonight, for every person that's uh, come out this way tonight. God, I pray that you would speak to each one of us, Father, that we would see, God, that um, through, through the teaching of your word, through the instruction that you've given through your Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the Philippians, that, God, we would see that there, there really is a, a ditch for us to avoid. As we are running this race, as we are living this life, God, we need to recognize that there is a way to stay on course and there is a way to get off course. God, I pray that that would be clear as we read through these scriptures, as Paul is giving this warning, as he's talked about his own personal experiences and how true the gospel is, that, that we cannot save ourselves. It takes a God-given salvation, that it has to be a gift of God. We cannot earn it. It has to be through your love, through your grace. We could never earn it. That's the conclusion that Paul came to in his life, and because, God, that is the truth. So, Father, I pray that that would be so clear to us tonight, that, Father, we would not abuse the forgiveness that you have shown to us, that, God, we would, we would accept that forgiveness, and that, God, it would transform us, that, God, as you come into our life, as you forgive us of our sin, of every mistake we've ever made or ever will make, that, God, that would not be an excuse to be, to be lazy or to lay down, but it would, it would be a reason, a very justifiable reason, God, to live to, to the best of our ability for you. God, that's our, that is the correct response to what you have done for us, the miracle that you've worked in our life. So, Father, I pray that it would be clear tonight, God, as we go through these scriptures, as Paul is explaining these things to, Philipp to the Philippians 2,000 years ago, to the, the believers there at Philippi, I pray, God, that it would be clear also to us here tonight, as these truths are eternal and they never change. So, Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity. We pray your blessing upon it now, that your spirit, God, would fill this place, fill each one of us, and give us understanding and wisdom, God, of what you have revealed, that we would not miss it. God, there's so many that think they have it and they've missed it. God, we do not want to be those. But we do not want to be one of those. Christ made it very clear in Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, have we not cast down devils in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? But he will, he will profess to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. God, please don't let us be part of that. Let us, God, take an honest assessment of ourselves to see, God, if we were in, in fellowship with you, God, if we truly have experienced your forgiveness and that, that life-changing miracle of you coming into our life, forgiving us of our sin, that, God, we can be your children and we can spend eternity with you. We pray and ask all these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated. So what Paul recognizes in what he's addressed in the previous verses is that he was running in error. He was going the wrong way. In this race of life, he was going the wrong way. But what he's saying is now he has the truth. Now his life is finally on course. Christ has appeared in his life. He has put his life on course. So what does he do now? I mean, he's been running, and he's been running, I mean, fervently. He's been running with everything he's got. But he realized he was going the wrong way. When he encounters Christ, he recognizes he's been going the wrong way, trying to, to earn his salvation, trying to earn God's favor. But now Christ has come into his life. Now he has the truth. Now his life is on course. What is he going to do now? Is he going to stop running? No, he's going to run even harder, straining and exerting himself, looking ahead. As he says there in verse 13, I don't count myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. What he's saying is I'm, that, that's a, a statement of exertion. He's reaching forth. He's exerting himself, looking ahead, because now he's finally, after wasting years of his life, wasting decades of his life, he's finally on track. And he's saying, I'm now going to run harder than I ever have before. We come down to verses 14 through 16. He says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, and that, that's talking about perfection or coming to like maturity. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect or as be mature, be thus minded. And if anything, you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, where until we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So what Paul is saying here, he's saying, I'm going to go after it. Now, as, he, as he's a Christian, now he was a Pharisee before, he was, he was trying to accomplish these things through the Jewish religion, through his accolades, through his achievements. 
Paul says, now that I'm a Christian, now that I'm following Christ, now that I know that my life is on course, I'm, I'm now walking in the truth. Paul is saying, I'm going to go after it. I'm going to live my life and, 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 and run this race for Christ with everything I've got. And what he's saying is that every mature believer should follow that exact same example. That we should have that same mentality, that same intensity. That in light of what Christ has done for us, you think about Christ on the cross. He made, I think it was seven statements from the cross. One of those statements was, it is finished. And the statement he's making is, is that our, he's saying the debt is paid. I have a sin debt, you have a sin debt that we could never pay. Christ said, the debt is paid. That, that's my debt, that's your debt. If we put our faith in Christ, our debt can be paid through Him. And, and so in one sense, there's a finality there that, to say, it's been finished, Christ has completed it. I don't add anything to that. And if we're not careful, we can misinterpret that to say, well, if Christ has completed the work, if it's finished, then He's done and I'm done. But that's what Paul is saying, that is not the case. Because Christ has finished the work, we should spend our entire life living for Him because of what He's accomplished on our behalf. That's not a time to sit down, that's not a time to stop. That's a time to exert ourselves even more in the cause of Christ, not trying to earn anything, but because we love Christ and we appreciate what He's done for us. Now Paul recognizes that there are varying levels of maturity. In this room right now, there are no two people in this room. If you're, you're here tonight and you're a Christian, there's no two people in this room who have the exact same level of maturity. There's varying levels of maturity. And Paul recognized that. And what he's saying there, it's kind of some confusing wording as you come down there. But what he's saying is, is that if there are things that you don't fully understand, and that's going to be the case with everybody to different extents. When he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect or be mature, be thus minded. So he's saying, I'm going to give it everything I've got. I'm going to exert myself to the fullest. And all those who are mature believers should do the same. And then he goes on and says, and if there be anything in which you are otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So he's saying if there's things that you're otherwise minded, that you're, you're, you still don't understand, you're confused about, you know, he's recognizing that, that there's varying levels of maturity, but he's saying this, you know the gospel. The gospel is this, that Jesus Christ came into this world, He lived a perfect sinless life, He died upon the cross to pay for our sin, He died upon the cross on a Friday, He was dead Friday, Saturday, Sunday, on Sunday, He rose again from the dead, proving He truly was the Son of God, He truly was the perfect payment for sin, He rose again as evidence that, that He was the Son of God, and He is the Son of God, and that we can resurrect just as He resurrected one day in the resurrection. That is the gospel. And Paul is saying, if there's things that you're confused about, things that you don't fully understand, that's fine. But you know the gospel. If you've been saved, if you've experienced that forgiveness of God in Christ, you know the gospel. Live the gospel. And then he goes on to say, you're going to continue to grow in your maturity and in your understanding, but you know the gospel, and he's calling them to live the gospel with everything they've got. We come on down to verse 17. Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an example. So Paul is saying, he's issuing a challenge. He's saying, you know, as he is a believer, as he is a Christian, as he's living a sold-out life for Christ, he's issuing a challenge as an example. He's saying, look at me as an example of this. Follow me, as he told the Corinthians earlier, follow me as I'm following Christ. But it's not, just, um, it's not just restricted to himself. He's saying that there are others. You think about men like Timothy, men like Epaphroditus, who we've talked about earlier in this letter, like Luke, like Silas, other traveling companions of Paul, who the Philippians were familiar with. He's saying we have great examples of followers of Christ. Follow their example. But we also, as we're going to see in verse 18, we also have great examples of false Christians. We also have great examples of what not to do. Listen to verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, who God, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Paul says there are others who are living as enemies of the cross. 
the way that he's wording this and what he's addressing here, he's not talking about pagans. He's not talking about um, you know, other believers in false religions. He's talking about those who profess to be Christians. And I'll say this, that they are living as enemies of the cross. False Christians will do more damage to the cross of Christ, to the, to the cause of the gospel, the spread of the kingdom of God. False Christians will do more damage than anyone. An atheist, a militant atheist, um, a militant Muslim or Hindu could never even come close to doing the damage to Christianity that a false Christian can do. And we need to be keenly aware of that living in East Tennessee. You know, we, we, you talk to people, and this is becoming less the case today, but most people you talk to will tell you they, that they believe that they're a Christian. But what Paul is addressing here is he's saying there are people who profess to be Christians, but who are in fact enemies of the cross of Christ. They are not truly Christians just because they make that claim. And what he's saying here is he talks about whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. He's not just talking about something like gluttony or you, know, you kind of think about associating that with food or something like that. But what he's saying is, is that they're, all they live for is their own pleasure. All they live for is their own indulgence, their own pleasure. They live basically selfishly only for themselves, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Their mind is not upon the things of Christ, it's not upon heavenly things, but rather it's upon earthly things, while professing to be a Christian. What Paul's describing here is this. This is the, as we talked about two weeks ago, this is the opposite ditch of those who are trying to earn their salvation by morality, by living a good enough life, by doing good works. This is the opposite ditch. But it's still a ditch. Even though this is the opposite, there are, there are ditches on both sides of the course, they're opposites, but they're both ditches. What, what Paul is addressing here is that there were, so there were believers who thought that, they, or there were maybe professing Christians who thought that they could keep the law and earn their salvation. There were those who did it in Judaism, but also those who did that professing to be Christians. That they were earning their salvation, they were working for and earning it. In this other ditch, what you have are groups of people, and I think this is probably more of a temptation in our society, in our culture today, are people who say, I accept the grace of God. I accept that God has, has forgiven me. I, I, I believe so strongly in the grace of God that God loves sinners, and therefore I'm going to use that grace as a cover for my love of sin. That's what Paul is addressing. Those who would try to abuse or misuse the grace of God to try to cover up their love for sin. But the fact is you can't love sin and love Christ. And Paul is saying they are not truly believers if that's how they're using the grace of God. Basically, it's the mentality, you've heard this before, especially leveled against people of the Baptist denomination that, you know, that Baptists teach that you can get saved and live any way you want. That's what Paul's addressing. That you can get saved and live any way you want. And the mentality that I've also heard within the Baptist church is, as long as you're saved, that's all that matters. That's not true. In fact, when somebody is living a life where they say, well, there's absolutely zero fruit of salvation in my life, but I know I'm saved. That's the mentality that Paul is addressing here to say, their end is destruction. You will know them by their fruits. When Christ comes into your life, truly comes into your life, there's a transformation. That transformation is not what saves you, but if Christ truly comes into your life, it changes your nature. It, there's a transformation that takes place, and you can no longer love sin while you love Christ as a true believer. And Paul, this is not something new. It's not just something new to the 21st century. This was true in the first century during Paul's day. He addresses this throughout the letters. He addresses this in Romans. He addresses it in 1 Corinthians. And he addresses it here at the letter of the Philippians. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. The fact is, you can go to hell as a moral person. There are moral people who are in hell today. There are very moral people who are on their way to hell. Or... You can go to hell as an immoral person. Take your pick. There is, there is a godless morality. 
If God's morality is I'm a good person, but you think about me if, if, as an example, I'm a, I'm a good man, I'm a, I'm a good employee, I'm a good husband, I'm a good father, but I don't have any use for Christ. I mean, you're living a good life, you're living a moral life, um, you know, I, I don't use foul language, I don't, I'm not an alcoholic, I, you know, there's all these things that, that I live a good, clean, moral life. Do you have Christ? No. You're lost. Paul lived a more moral life than you could ever live. He was lost. If he had died in that state, he would have been separated from God for all eternity. There is a godless, Christless, moral life. There's also a godless, Christless, immoral life. That's a little bit easier to recognize, but the point is both of them are Christless. Both of them are, even though they look drastically different, we're talking about two groups of people who do not possess Christ. They do not have Christ. And even though they're, they're opposites in a lot of ways, both are fixated on earthly things. Both are fixated on temporal things. Either on keeping the rules or breaking the rules, but they're not fixated on Christ. But for those who are truly following Christ, as we see, as we're thinking about these two digits that Paul's addressing that are still alive and well today, but for those of us who are truly following Christ, we have a race to run, a course to complete. We're not going to fall into or get drug into either ditch. There is only one thing on our mind and one thing only, and that is the finish line, where Christ is waiting. We live and run above these ditches and snares and gutters. We're focused upon Christ, upon His righteousness, upon what He's done for us. We're focused upon that finish line where Christ is waiting for us. That's what Paul describes here in these last few verses, 20 and 21. He says, For our conversation, our way of life, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. When he says vile body, don't think about an evil body or sinful body. He's talking about our, our body as, as weak, as frail, who will change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. What Paul is saying is that the, true, the mark of a true Christian is they are fixated on heavenly things, things that are above. They're looking ahead, they're looking up, fixated on Christ, on heavenly things. But this, as, as we're focusing on those things, we're thinking about the finish line, we're thinking about their being in the presence of Christ, we're be, being with him in the resurrection, that we will receive glorified bodies in the resurrection when all things are made new. That this body, basically as we think about going into the presence of God, we recognize that, th that these bodies in which we live are, are, are frail, are corrupted. There's no way we can live in the presence of God eternally with, with, um, in our current state. That there has to be a transformation. Just as Christ was crucified, He died upon the cross for our sin. When He rose again on the third day, His body was glorified. It incorporated this physical body, but His body was glorified. It says that we're going to receive the same glorified body to where we can be there both spiritual and physical in the presence of God in the new heavens and the new earth when all things are made new in the resurrection. As we wrap up tonight, I'll, I'll conclude with this. As Christians, we are running a race. Basically, this is the race of all races. In, in running this race, it makes the Barkley Marathon basically look like a stroll through the park for chumps compared to the race that we're engaged in. If you were to define those 15 finishers of that race, out of the 1,000 participants, over 1,000 uh, of those who participated in the Barkley Marathon, if you were to find those 15 people that completed it, who ran the, who ran the 100 miles within 60 hours, who completed the race, I'll promise you those are individuals who are very focused, they're very disciplined, but if you take those 15 finishers and you challenge them to live for Christ in this world without Christ and without the Holy Spirit, 
They would drop out and they're dead in, in 30 seconds. The race that we're engaging in as Christians is the race of all races. As far as requiring that discipline, um, to follow Christ, to deny yourself, it goes far beyond anything, any physical race that can be run in this life. There, if you, if you want to challenge, you've come to the right place. You can skip the Barkley Marathon. If, you're gonna, if you want to challenge, live for Christ in this world. That's the race that we're engaged in. But we're going to wrap up with that tonight, close with that tonight, and slip into our groups um, for a time of discussion.